Hello, you are all welcome to today's session. Today we are going to be looking at the types of female pelvis. And then we'll be looking at a few objectives that we'll be using as a form of assessment for ourselves to see how far the studies has gone. So I'll be reading out the objectives and then at the end of the, at the, end of the lesson, we'll look at um, our evaluation to see if we have actually met those objectives. So at the end of the session, we should be able to describe the four types of the female pelvis that we have. We should be uh, we should be able to describe the measurement of the pelvis as well. We should be able to explain the relationship between the fetal skull and the pelvis. So let's begin our introduction. We know that the pelvis varies in both sexes and in different members of the same sex. So looking at the pelvis structurally, we know that the pelvis differ. If, even if you are considering the same sex, let's say females, for instance, they are all females anyway, but there might be variations when we are looking at the pelvis. Then the size of the pelvis is generally not influenced by height of the individual. Mostly people think that the height of the individual also has a factor in influencing the length or the diameter of the various aspects of the, the pelvis. However, this is not actually so. So occasionally it is contracted in all the dimensions. The pelvis can also contract to know. Now moving on, we have a um, cephalopelvic disproportion, which will result in, uh, which actually results, sorry, when a fetus is large, cephalopelvic disproportion. So when, when we are looking at a very large fetus, not actually very large per se, but a fetus that is actually large, so can actually result to cephalopelvic disproportion. The pelvis is categorized into four, four main parts by cardwall and then molly. So we're looking at these four categories of the pelvis. Then we have gynecoid pelvis, gynecoid pelvis. Now we are going to look at the characteristics of gynecoid pelvis so that in, when we are, we are able to see, when we see we come across a pelvis, we will be able to differentiate, okay, looking at the various characteristics, which of these classifications by Molin or Cadwell will it fall under? So looking at gynecoid pelvis, it is the best for childbearing. Gynecoid pelvis is the best for childbearing. And then looking at the brim, the brim is very round. The brim is the outer projection of the pelvis. So the brim is round in terms of anatomy. And then the cavity is shallow. The cavity is just the hollow portion of the, the pelvis, and it's usually centrally placed within the bone, the skeletal system. When we look at the pelvis into, um, into details as a structure, you can see that the cavity is actually shallow. The sacrum is actually caved. The sacrum can be located at the posterior portion. It's um, kind of a tail-like structure that is found posteriorly. In the pelvis and it's curved well and then the pubic arc angle is around 90 degrees so these are the char char characteristics sorry <laughs> so these are the characteristics of a gynecoid pelvis so let's recap characteristics of a gynecoid pelvis first it is the best for childbearing the brain is also very round the cavity is shallow the sacrum is well curved and then the pubic arc angle is around 90 degrees so i hope you'll be able to remember this All right so let's proceed. Still on gynecoid pelvis, the anterior aspect is round. The anterior talks about the front, okay, the location, the ante before. The fetus presenting with the head, the occiput, which is the most favorable part, it can easily pass through the gynecoid pelvis. That is why it is actually considered to be the best for childbearing because the, the fetus which present its head first during delivery or labor is actually the most favorable and can easily pass through the pelvis without any form of obstructions or any form of distress. Right. Actually, I don't have a, um, a diagram to show in the video, so I'll send a note so that when you are going through the notes, you can actually make reference to the notes. All right. So let's move. And the second one to look at, according to Cadwell and Molly, is the android pelvis. The android pelvis actually resembles that of the male. Usually there is a structural difference between the male pelvis and the female pelvis when we are take, taking the anatomy of the pelvis into consideration. So today you know that the pelvis of a male looks different in terms of anatomy than that of, to that of a female. And then however, in females also, the pelvis also differs in shape, or 
in size or shape based on maybe a variety of factors, maybe abnormalities, maybe based on several factors play come into play. All right, still under Android province, the bones are heavier than that of a female. The bones are heavier than that of a female. Sorry. And then the brim is heart shaped. When you look at the brim of the pelvis, it, it's, it's in the form of a hat. So for you to differentiate between an android pelvis and then a gynacoid pelvis, the factors to look at is for a gynacoid pelvis, first, it is the best for childbearing. The reason is that the fetus presenting its head can easily pass through, or the occiput can easily pass through. The anterior aspect of the gynacoid pelvis is round. And then uh, the brim is also round, and the cavity is also shallow, that is centrally placed. The sacrum, which is a theo like structure posteriorly, is well curved. And then the pubic arc angle is around 90 degrees. However, in the other one, which is the android pelvis, it resembles that of the male. And then the bones are heavier than that of the females, so when you are wearing. And then the brim is heart shaped. Notice that in um, gynacoid pelvis, the brim is round, but in Android pelvis, the brim is heart shaped. So a question could come in your exams. Um, you have a pelvis which looks round. Then which pelvis do you think you'll be looking at? You'll be looking at an Android pelvis, for sure. And then for Android pelvis, the inlet of the pelvis is narrow. And the, tri the transverse, sorry, the transverse diameter is close to the sacrum. When we are talking about the transverse portion, we are talking about an imaginary line Okay, anatomically that we are looking at that divides the cavity of the pelvis. The cavity of the pelvis is just the hollow portion, the hollow portion of the pelvis. And usually the hollow portion is centrally placed, is in the middle of the pelvis. Okay, so look, let's imagine a hole in the pelvis at the center of the pelvis. And then there is an imaginary line that's cut through from left to, to right, okay. Note that the cavity is round, but in android portion, it's heart shaped. So let's look at a line cutting through the cavity, okay? And that line is what we use as our diameter, divides it into two portions, two semi-halves, okay? So the diameter is close to the circle. So we can look at the diameter that, okay, that when we are considering it, it's moving closer posteriorly to that thin line structure we call the circle. Okay, then the cavity has a poor curve. The cavity has a poor curve. Because it's not round, we can see it has a poor curve. It almost has shaped. Then the sacrum is longer. The sacrum, which is that tail like structure, is actually longer. It is very deep and looks like a funnel. It's funnel shaped. Okay. So when you look at any pelvis structurally and you see that it's funnel shaped, the sacrum, which is that tail like structure, is longer than that of the gynecoid structure. And in the cavity is poorly curved. Okay, and it's heart shaped and it's usually heavier than that of a female, then you are actually looking at an android pelvis, which more or less looks like a male pelvis. All right, let's box on. So on the android pelvis, the outlet is narrow. The outlet is narrow. The outlet is just a portion that serves as an exit for the fetus, maybe during, uh, sorry, not maybe, actually during delivery, okay? And the ischial spines are sharp and then turn inward. We have spines we call ischial, I-S-C-H-I-A-L. Ischial spines are sharp and then they turn inward. The outlet diameter is rather reduced in Android pelvis. The outlet diameter is rather reduced. And note that previously we said that the diameter is close to the sacrum. The sacrum is longer. It's um, the cavity looks like it's heart shaped that means it's not actually very round sorry something is choking me it's actually not very round and then when we look at it in terms of weight it's actually heavier in that than that of females okay when we are looking at an android pelvis all right sorry all right so we are looking at platypiloid Pelvis, platypiloid, it's spelled P L A T Y D E L L O I D, platypiloid, pelvis. 
Now, when we are talking about platypiloid pelvis, so how can we differentiate? How can we identify a platypiloid pelvis? Looking at the structure of the pelvis, it looks like a kidney at the brain. So first, you have to consider the brain to look like a kidney. Unlike the uh, previous one, which we talked about, the android pelvis, which is, which is heart-shaped, the platypiloid looks more or less like a kidney the, at the brain. Okay. And then anterior posterior diameter, the, uh, sorry, the anterior posterior, <laughs> the anterior posterior diameter is reduced. When we talk about the anterior posterior diameter, we are talking about, we are looking at, let's just imagine a pelvis in front of us, the structure of your pelvis. Okay. And then look at it, look at the center, try to picture the cavity, a hollow opening. That means there is a space that separates the front from the back. The front from the back. The front portion serves as the anterior portion, and the back portion just serves as the posterior portion. So we have anterior posterior diameter. So we are looking at a line that extends from the front portion moving towards the back portion. Okay. I, I hope you are you are able to understand. Yeah, you should understand. So anterior posterior portion, the diameter is actually reduced. That means if you measure from the front to the back in, within the cavity, you should have. Um, a smaller measurement in diameter. Then the ischial spines are blunt. Unlike the um, uh, android pelvis, they are sharp. The ischial spines are sharp and then they are turned inward. They are turned inward and then they are very sharp. But in platypiloid pelvis, it, is, it has a shape of a kidney. When you are looking at the brain, the anterior posterior diameter is reduced. The ischial spines are blunt. That's in platypiloid pelvis. Then the head you need to engage with the sagittal suture. The sagittal suture is just, uh, let's, let's take the head for instance. The sagittal suture divides the head into from the front to the back. So it moves from the front to the back. That means it will divide the head into right and then left halves. Okay. So when we are considering the same thing at the, with the um, uh, pelvis, then it will be any line okay, that will divide the pelvis into right and left house. So the head needs to engage with the sagittal suture when we are looking at the platypiloid pelvis. Then the head descends without, with difficulty. Actually, when I'm talking about the head, I'm not referring to our actual head. I'm just using it for a reference, okay? The head descends with difficulty. For you to actually better appreciate this, you should go back to the anatomy of the pelvis and then study it, study its structures. And then you better appreciate this portion of the lecture. All right. Then we also have an anthropoid pelvis. For the anthropoid pelvis, the brain is longer in terms of diameter. It's very long. Then it has oval brain. Oval shape is not completely spherical. So it's oval. Then anterior posterior portion is actually larger. That means when we measure from the anterior portion, the frontal portion, towards the back. It should have a longer length in terms of diameter. And the sacrum is longer and concave. The sacrum is longer, but it's concave, concave. Yeah. Then the ischial spines are not projected in anthropoid pelvis. The ischial spines are not projected. They are not. Then subpubic angles are very wide. Okay, the subpubic angles are very wide. And then mostly, Tall women have this type of pelvis. The anthropoid pelvis are usually prominent in women that are tall. Then labor does not normally pose any problems anyway if a person has an anthropoid pelvis. All right. So we have a gynecoid pelvis, a platypiloid pelvis, android pelvis, and anthropoid pelvis, according to Cadwell and Moore. So these are the types of pelvis we have. And then looking at their various um, portions to be considered, considering them in terms of um, imaginary lines, we have anterior posterior portions of the pelvis, which talks about the front and then the back of the pelvis. And then we have uh, the transverse diameter. Sorry, it should actually be the anterior posterior diameter, which, which is a measurement taken from the front of the pelvis moving towards the back. Okay, and then we have a transverse diameter of the pelvis, which is just any imaginary line that moves from the left side to the right side. And then we measure the length 
within the cavity. And then we also have the oblique portion, which slants from one portion, extending to the opposite side of the portion. When we talk about our oblique line, you understand how it moves. It moves from one the upper corner of one towards the lower corner of the other. So if the line started from the right portion, it moves towards the left, but it's just from top to bottom. The same way, if you are looking at an oblique line from the left portion superiorly at the top, then it will extend from the top corner, which is at the left side, and moving to the uh, bottom part at the right corner. So those are the various divisions. I hope this, this lecture was very helpful uh, for references in case you want to exploit for further information. You, could, you can check Marshall, J and Reno, 2014, Miles textbook for midwives, 14th edition, Churchill, Livingston. You can as well check, verify, Verals, Verals S, 1993, Anatomy and Physiology, applied to obstetrics, 3rd edition, Churchill, Livingston. Leave your comments below and uh, if there are any suggestions, if there's something I also missed, I'm ready to learn it. Um, have a nice weekend. Bye for now.